Some of you may have been to a presentation I did a while back on this. Uh, this is a moving target. They're always adding and changing things. So hopefully you'll have uh, see some new things that NIH and uh, is doing with um, this compliance. So briefly, I'm, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to still go over the policy, especially for newbies who just came and were, the compliance was dumped on them and they still don't even have a concept of what this NIH public access policy is. We're going to talk about complying with it. Uh, going to tell you how to submit a manuscript to the NIH manuscript submission system. You might hear the term NIMS. Uh, we're going to talk about the NIH access policy and the grant process, and then the policy and ERA Commons. If you don't know what ERA Commons, I'll give you an explanation of what that is as we get to that part of the presentation. So here's the announcement that went out. It first started as a mandate, and then President Obama made it a requirement. So it has to be followed. And basically what it says is that anybody who produces a manuscript, a publication that has in, uh, been funded by an NIH grant is obliged and must deposit that peer-reviewed version of the manuscript into PubMed Central. And there are some time frames. This went into effect April 7, 2008. So anything from that date forward that was published, that was uh, NIH grant funding was used, needs to be deposited. There is some confusion about 12 months. 12 months is the embargo period. Okay. F, uh, uh, author or principal investigator gets, gets a notification from the journal, we have accepted, we will be publishing this. It's really a good idea to then start the compliance process because often if you wait too long, you can't find the version of the manuscript that you need to deposit, especially if it's a graduate student or a postdoc and they leave and you don't have the, the version that's necessary to deposit. And also, you need to comply with copyright when you're doing this deposit. So PubMed Central, what is that? That's in a repository. It's an archive that is a part of the National Institutes of Health uh, National Library of Medicine. It is a place where these items that you deposit are, are available. There is a permanent place that is free to anybody that they can get the full text of the manuscript that you've deposited. They do follow copyright. So that's, you'll hear the term PMC, PubMed Central. That's what that is, and we'll see that in a minute. And the NIMS, National Institute of Health uh, Deposit System, this is the portal where you start the deposit process. And there's different ways of getting access to it, and I'm going to show you that as we move forward. This is what it is. Uh, everything NIH and NCBI or anything does, they're always saying it makes it simpler. Sometimes the person at the end, at the other end that needs to do it, doesn't find it that simple. But that's their mantra. This makes it simple, makes it easier. So how do you comply? Again, here is the policy in short. Any article that has been accepted for publication at, on or after April 7, 2008, even if it's in press, uh, it's been peer reviewed, it's been funded by an NIH grant, needs to be in compliance. Okay? And when you do this, and you will find, and our gatekeepers up in front, when you send them a proposal, a non-competing renewal, um, a progress report and you cite something and there's no P, there's no number showing compliance, either a NIH manuscript submission ID or a PubMed Central ID, they will send it back to you and say, you need to be in compliance. We cannot move it forward to NIH. Um, who is responsible? Okay, the responsible person is the principal investigator 
whose grant has been acknowledged, even if they are not an author on the manuscript. Okay? Often there are training grants, center grants, which have a lot of faculty on there who use funding from the training grant or the core funding. They have to make sure or work with the PI on that grant to make sure anything that they publish where they acknowledge that funding that they have deposited it. And you, if you were, if one of your faculty or you as a faculty are on any of those types of grants and they come to a point where they have to do uh, renewal, they will come back to you and say, we need to make sure you have complied because you've acknowledged our, our training grant. And that would be um, when you're gonna have to get, start running quickly and get it deposited. The institution, and that's why we have these gatekeepers up in front. The institution also needs to make sure that all their NIH grantees are complying because we get a lot of NIH grant funding. So it's um, incumbent upon the institution, which are these people up front, to make sure that all their researchers are complying. Okay. Not just NIH grant holders or uh, but there are other um, and, uh, grant holders that need to comply. For example, the Howard Hughes Institute, their grantees are required to follow this through if, if you are working with or for an and, uh, Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute researcher. They have a little more stringent requirements. What's nice about uh, Howard Hughes is that they will deposit the final version and they will deposit it for their researchers. So that's nice. There's also something called PubMed Central UK. Anyone who's got funding through the Wellcome Trust, which is similar to our NIH, they need to deposit as well. I had an instance where someone came back and, and the, they were working on a training grant or a core grant, and they said, well, I've deposited this, the faculty, uh, it's been deposited by my collaborator at Wellcome Trust at UK PMC. That number won't work. They may have acknowledged the Wellcome Trust grant, but if they've also acknowledged the training grant or that PI's grant, they need to deposit it into PubMed Central. So there needs to be two deposits. So maybe you just don't want to collaborate with somebody in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Okay, steps in complying. Determine if the publication needs to be, needs to be, uh, meet the compliance. Um, address copyright, submit the manuscript, and then include either the PubMed Central ID, which we'll explain a little more as we move on, or the NIH manuscript submission system in anything that you cite. That includes if you're including somebody's bio sketch in your grant application or in the training grant, which may have 60 um, faculty, and they send you the bio sketch. So if you are managing a training grant or a core grant and you need to be in, uh, renewing it, you should really start early because you may have 60 faculty that you have to make sure that their bio sketches are in compliance. Okay. Now, as far as copyright, this is really important. Um, since I don't publish in any journal that I need to comply because I don't have an NIH grant, I, I'm assuming that some publishers will send you the copyright agreement where they will ask, has this been funded by an NIH grant? If it doesn't say that, it's there. you can add, even in pencil, um, pen or whatever, to the copyright agreement saying this manuscript was funded in part by an NIH grant, it, I need to comply with the policy. And there, most publishers understand that at this point after four plus years that this is the case. But you can write it on the copyright agreement. There's nothing says you can't. 
and they need to be aware that you are going to comply. Again, here's the policy. So again, repeating is very important upon acceptance for publication. Again, because you don't want to lose track of that manuscript. The 12 months doesn't mean you have 12 months to deposit. It means, and we'll see what that means, is embargoing it. And we're going to see what an embargo means. Uh, if you just received notification that it's going to be published, you need to embargo the release of it for 12 months. You need to let the journal have the first bite of the apple to get the full text out there. And I'll show you what this looks like when you deposit something into the system. Again, here are the steps, peer-reviewed, accepted for, here's the date, and arising from some NIH funding. And those uh, researchers that are at NIH, for example, the National Cancer Institute, and they publish something, they also need to comply and they need to follow the same steps as the person out there that's not at NIH. Again, talking about copyright, again, you can write this in your copyright agreement before you sign it if there's nothing there indicating that you check it for saying it was NIH funded. So what do you have to consider? Number one it is what submission system you're going to use, what version of the paper that you will be make available in PubMed Central. Remember, you cannot click on like the M get it button and download the PDF, that cannot be deposited. So remember that, even if you're supporting someone and say, well, here it is, here's the PDF, you need to come back to them or else give a link to the uh, public access policy saying that belongs, to, that belongs to the journal. Once you sign that copyright agreement, uh, the author signs it, every, it belongs to the journal including the page proofs. Okay, so don't try to deposit page proofs. Usually on the uh, cross it will say destroy after. So that's, you can't deposit that. So you submit the paper and then there needs to be approval of the, what is deposited into the NIMS system. Until that approval is given, PubMed Central ID will not be assigned. Okay, so, so here we go, the really important part, how you deposit. Your form, yes. Could, could we save the questions till at the end? Okay, write it down and we'll have question and answer. Okay? So there's four methods to deposit a manuscript that needs to be in compliance. This is a little foggy. That's not bad. A, B, C, and D, four methods. So method A is uh, a journal that will deposit the final version of the manuscript. In other words, that PDF that you click on, like if you're uh, in PubMed and you see an M get it button or publishers and you click on that, that version is deposited by the journal. Okay. So it'd be nice to publish only in those journals, then you won't have to jump through the hoops of making sure you comply. Okay. And there is a list, and here's the URL, and if you download the version of this, you will see the URL, and you can find out if the, if the journal publishes, you know, deposits the final version, so you're fine. When you look at this list, for example, Blood is one of the journals that deposits. You need to look at the date that they started depositing it. If it was, the date was after April 7th, 2008, you're fine. If, you're, if, it was, if the date was, was, did not fall into that, they published it like this year they started depositing, you, the author or the PI needs to comply. So those dates of when they started putting in the full text of the, man, the publication is very important. You just can't make the assumption. The other thing is, and when we look at the um, NIMS system, when you go ahead and start depositing something, the system will say, you do not need to. 
the journal does it. So you can just stop right there. So before it goes on any further, the system will let you know that you're off the hook. So this is very, something you need to be very careful of. That often on a copyright agreement, there'll be a little box that says, would you like this manuscript to be deposited in open access? Or deposited, or, or uh, you give us an agreement that we can post it on our web page, anyone can click on it, find that is in compliance but there's usually a fee that they don't tell you about. So when you check that, they will tack on to the publication fee anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000. So do not check that box because the policy, the NIH public access policy says you don't have to do that. You just have to deposit a version, a peer reviewed version. So this, I think everybody's aware of that, all the authors and the PIs not to check that box unless you have an extra thousand or two thousand that they can tack on to the exorbitant fee they charge you for publishing your manuscript in the colors in the plates, which is very expensive. Um, these are some of the journal publishers that are involved in doing that. Method C, this is the method that most people are going to, most researchers, authors are have to uh, will be using, and that's the one where the author or the principal investigator or someone they've assigned to do that does the deposit. Mm -hmm. And D is similar to method C, but the journal deposits a version, a, a peer-reviewed version. They do it for the author, and it usually says in their instructions to author that they will do this. Once they do that, the author or the principal investigator is not off the hook. They put some a version in there, and then the person that they, it's usually the author or the principal investigator, they the publisher has indicated who NIH or who NIH MS, manuscript submission, needs to notify to uh, approve the deposit. So if you are supporting a faculty, you need to make them clearly aware of the fact that they need to approve, even if the journal does it in, as method D. The other thing is, you see in the red, sometimes they're just going to put in the letter of the law, the follow it that says the final peer reviewed. That's even before any typos are corrected, anything like that. Some of the journals just put that in and it doesn't really look good. It looks like you uh, are not speaking English sometimes because there may have been something that um, the sentence wasn't constructed correctly and um, the reviewer doesn't say, well, this, this sentence isn't constructed well. And that's the version that they put in, which is what the policy says, the final peer reviewed. So you need to make sure that what is in there or whoever is assigned to the approver, looks good. Doesn't have a lot of typos or anything. Um, you might have to fight with the journal on that because once they do it, they don't want to be bothered anymore. So what do you deposit? Journal articles only that have been funded by an NIH grant. Uh, the final peer reviewed. And it's up to you. I have some researchers I've worked with that take the text file and take the images and insert them into the document and then create a PDF and that's what they upload. So if you have a lot of time on your hands, you can do that, but that's not what you're, you need to do. It, the text part of the manuscript can be a DOC, a DOXT, uh, rich text format. So any type, any format like that. You also need to make sure that any tables or images or supplemental data that are not embedded in the text but are part of the publication, those need to be submitted as well. Okay. Again, there's a magic date, April 7, 2008 forward. Don't try to deposit book chapters. Books, book chapters are not peer reviewed. Okay. Um, again, non-peer reviewed articles, letters to the editor, commentary, conference proceedings, they don't want that. 
uh, and any dissertation. Even though a faculty member may have a graduate student working on their dissertation and they are getting funded, part of their salary is getting funded uh, by their NIH grant, that doesn't need to be deposited. It's not peer reviewed even though the, com the dissertation committee may look at it and make comments. It's not what's considered peer review. So it gets you off the hook. Again, upon acceptance for publication, the, um, the 12 month is the embargo. It doesn't mean you have 12 months. However, there are instances when, uh-oh, we forgot to deposit. There's no reason you can't do it at point of need, but it's really better to do it when you still in the PI or you have access to that manuscript. I've had cases where it's gone somewhere and no one can find it. Okay, or the person who actually has that version has left the lab or left the university and it's so difficult for, to track them down or they they haven't even kept it. So make so it's best to do it at, at the point when you have access to the document. Okay, there's four steps and we're going to I'm going to show you how this works, but step 1 is setting up the manuscript, submitting all the manuscript files, everything that's uh, involved in the publication approving the deposit so that a PMC can be uh, assigned. And then there's a approving on the web. And I'll show you what that looks like. So it's the approver. If you are supporting somebody and you deposit it, I would be loath to make myself the approver because I don't understand the science or the text or if the images didn't look good. So really put the onus on either the, one of the authors or the principal investigator to approve the um, submission. So here's what it looks like, the manuscript submission system. And there's four portals that you click on to log in. So the first is for NIH or ERA Commons. You can do it through that portal. The second is the publisher. This is where the journals go. They have access to that part of the deposit system. Howard Hughes has their own portal to deposit for their researchers. And then the My NCBI. My NCBI is a place for anyone who's been assigned by a NIH grantee to do this for them. So we'll um, show you how that works. So once you get into the system by one of those four portals, you'll get an information screen, which is hopefully covered in this uh, presentation. And you just click continue. And here's how you start. You click on submit a new manuscript. The first thing you put in is the journal name. And there is a, a, a feed that as you type start typing a journal name, it will prompt you and it'll, it'll fill it in for you. Um, if you type lowercase, that's fine. You don't have to type, you know, have capitals or anything. They will put it in according to what the system wants. Then you put the manuscript title, title of the manuscript, and you click next to find the grant that you want to assign to this deposit. And you can do that in two ways. You can put in the author's first and last name. Or if you know the grant number, this is sort of tricky. Sometimes you put in a number and you know it's a grant number, but it doesn't quite come up. So it's funny how the, what the, the system will accept as a grant number. So if you have the first and last name, that's probably the best way. And you click the search button, and you get a list of the grant holder. This this NIH grantee, what grants they have. And you can select. There are often, looks like the same grant, you can see, and then there is .02, so this is the second iteration. It got refunded and refunded. It's up to you. It's probably fine to take the first iteration to cover all the deposits, even if the publication was, came out of the 05 version of the grant. As long as the first you know, NIH grant, ROK, RO8, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is acknowledged. And then you hit Next, Manuscript Info. 
This is the screen that allows you to upload all the different parts of the manuscript. So the first thing is the text file. And if you have a PDF, if you've had time to make a PDF out of everything, you just upload that. Because it should indicate figure one, figure two, and the figure should be in there. So that, that's fine. You just find that and just upload it. Then there's the figures, the tables, and the supplemental data. Trick is that you have to say in the line under label, you have to say figure one. If you don't, it will tell you you didn't label that file. And you can do figure or fig one, fig two, whatever. And then the table is the same thing. You have to label it as table one, table two, table three. And if you have more than one figure, you see at the bottom in blue, there's a little plus where you can click the plus and it'll give you another line for additional figures or additional tables. And even if there's more than one supplemental data. You would just click the add and it would give you another line. Again, you have to label it supplemental data. Okay. And this is what it looks like. You can see there was several figures, five figures, and two tables. And they have to be labeled. And when you do, when you've uploaded everything, you will see this window that will show you that the system is uploading all those files that you have put in this table. You have to wait till it's all done, otherwise it's not going to work. Upload files. And this is what it looks like when everything has been uploaded. You'll get a 100% has been put into the NIM system. Okay. And this is what it looks like after everything has been loaded. There's a PDF version, as you can see on the top, you can click on it and look at it. There's other things you have to make choices here on this screen. Um, once you do this, it's, I think it's amazing at how quickly that PDF is created. It's very much in real time. Don't you know, hit the reload button because you will see a message saying this may take a while. The system will refresh automatically every five seconds till everything is put in. So just give it a chance, especially if it's a real busy time. Um, a lot of people are, are scrambling to get everything in. So here is where you can make the embargo. Anywhere from immediately to 12 months. So you can make a judgment call. If it's been out there for a year or so, you can say immediate because the journal's already had a version out there. Or if it's been six months, you might say six months. So you can make a judgment call. If it's just you've just uh, received acceptance, I would put 12 months to be safe. You don't want to have any trouble with the journal. And here's everything's, um, everything has been made, the choices have all been made. If you don't check any of those boxes, the system will say you need to check whatever. So the system really um, gives you a good helping hand. And you hit the approve button. I wanted to go back here and show you who is the approver? The approver is the grant that we assigned, but especially if it's a center grant or a training grant, the PI is going to maybe not know anything about that publication. They, they're not an author on it. You can opt to select somebody else. You click the second button, you put in the person's first, last name, and their email address. Okay? So it can be somebody other than the PI. If you want to do it, if you're a support staff, that's up to you. And this is what uh, it says, awaiting author approval. Okay. It's at this point that they need to get someone who has been designated to approve the deposit. So here you go. And if on the second screen, the screen where you put in the journal name and the manuscript, there was a NIMS number if you want to go back. I can show that to you. Uh, hold on. So you get that NIMS ID number pretty much right away. That, that's the number you can use um, for compliance. So here it is. See, it's got all the journal information, 
uh, and the NIMS ID. The NIMS ID shows that you have started the process and you're in compliance. So if you need to grab that, you can grab that at any point because it's always there, even on the last screen where it says waiting. So it's up there and you can just grab that off there. So here it is, uh, after approval goes to whoever you've assigned to approve it. Um, they need to review uh, the, the PDF and they need to see if it looks good. If the images look good, uh, anything problem with it, they can say they don't approve and it will go back and you can make whatever corrections. So here is a PDF, this is what it looks like. What's going to be loaded into PubMed Central will not be that first page. This is for the person who's approving it to make sure it's the correct journal name, it's the correct grant, all those things. As long as everything there is right, that's when you hit approve, that's what's going to be put in the system. And then here's the PDF, the text file. And there's an online version of approval where they can click on that and they can go online and make any kind of changes here. If they want to request corrections, not necessarily the whole uh, version that's been deposited, they click on request collect corrections or approve if everything looks good, whichever. And the corrections are done just like a page proof. Okay, and here's what that looks like. So you click on request corrections, you get this page, and then you put in where on what sentence, what needs to be corrected. And anyone who's gotten page proofs understands how to go. You say on line 35, please put in this word instead of that word. And you can just do several corrections. You go add another request for correction so there can be different lines where you request some kind of spelling is wrong or something. So it can be right here. Okay. So after approval, you have the NIMS ID. So if you're doing it for somebody, you want to let them know this is the NIMS ID number for this deposit. And make sure if you are the approver that you don't delete any messages that come from NIMS. Because that's the message that says let you go in and approve. They send you three, they send the approver three messages. It's never moved out of the system, it's just put in hold. So if they forget and they realize they haven't approved it, they can go in either through ERA Commons or uh, uh, my NCBI and put the NIMS number in and then they just hit approve. And then it'll get moved back through the system for a PubMed Central ID to be assigned. Okay, so it's, it's never, you don't totally use, lose it. So here's what one of the um, Medline records looks like. You can see there's a PMID, and I'm gonna talk about the difference between a PMID and a PMC ID. So you can see this has a PMC ID right there. That shows compliance. And if you click on that link up there that says free in PubMed Central, you're gonna pull up the PDF that the NIM system has created from all those files that have been deposited, okay? And you can see, because of copyright, that at the bottom it says the final version of this is at the Nature Genetics site, okay? So it's letting you know that this isn't the final version. Copyright belongs to the journal. And you can see at the side, if someone prints this out, that it says that it's the manuscript version, okay? So it may not be the same version as they get when they go to the journal and click on PDF, which is gonna have the running title and all that information that they can't put in here. And here's a PMC ID and the NIMS ID, both of them. And it always also has this um, other articles that are citing this deposited article. So you can click on that. Those are articles that are in Medline. Okay, they're not necessarily if it's in another journal that's not in Medline. 
This one has a PMC. You can see the embargo available on. It's been embargoed. And you see there's no PubMed Central on this one because they can't release it until that date. OK, NIH public access policy and grant applications. Anything you uh, in relating to grants that are NIH. So you need to include the PubMed Central ID, and they'll tell you that. They'll send it back to you if it's not there, of anything you cite that has been funded in, by an NIH grant or the NIMS ID. Two numbers show compliance. That needs to be in biosketches. Again, if you're doing something on a training grant where there might be anywhere from 10 to 60 faculty and you have to include their biosketch, their biosketch has to be in compliance. And then your progress reports, your competing or non-competing renewal, anything you cite in those documents that you're citing a publication that was NIH grant funded. Okay. So it's better to do it before rather than when you get the message from either the ORPS people or from NIH. So we're very lucky here. We have these gatekeepers up front who actually will not pass it on to NIH until it's in compliance. There are many institutions that don't have that gatekeeper and they send it directly to NIH and then they get it back. Even though it may have been submitted on time, they're going to hold it. They're not going to process it until they're in compliance. So here's the different numbers to show compliance. And those journals that deposit the final version that are on that list in method A, um, you can say PMC journal in process because they actually get 12 months to do the deposit. They don't necessarily have to do it right away. So that's why you indicate PMC journal in process. Here's what it looks like. Do not include the PMID. Every record in Medline has a PMID. That's a social security number. That does not show compliance. And that's going to be a red flag from the people over at Wolverine Tower or NIH saying, uh-uh, this isn't what you need. We need either a PMC ID or a NIMS ID or PMC journal in process. Two, three, and four are the only ones that, that show compliance. I wouldn't even go with a PMID because that's going to be a red flag. Why are they putting this in? This isn't what we want. Now, I've had people say, well, what do I have to do with CVs? You can do anything with CVs. You can put a PMID and a PMC ID if you'd like, or the NIMS ID, because the CV does not go to NIH. It's, your, it's the faculty's personal like resume or you know, CV showing their publications. So you can include anything, all or nothing in the CVs. So this is what it might look like, someone citing it. OK. So the use of the DIMS ID, which you saw in some of those examples, it's a temporary number. At the beginning of the, when the policy went into effect, people were putting the NIMS number and walking away and just leaving it there for months or even years. NIH said, uh-uh, it needs to be approved so that we can generate a PMC number. Only three months. Again, if it's not approved, it's never like totally dumped out of the system. You can always go back in somehow either through ERA Commons or if you can log on to manu the NIMS system and just type in the NIMS ID and you'll pull it up and you hit approve. So it's still there, but it just hasn't moved through to have a PMC assigned. So here is a bio sketch. You can see um, PMC up there, number three. Um, you can see the NIMS, number four and also in other places. And the last one, PMC Journal in Process. Okay. 
So this is what a bioscope has to look like, even if it's the one of the faculty on a training grant. You now you have to make sure that the biosketch they send you to include in the training grant looks like this. That's why it's a good idea to start ahead of time. And this is a message that um, a grant holder may get. You can see they've included a PMID, but they're saying it's not in compliance. And they're saying you need to go to one of these methods and get get that manuscript deposited. So luckily we have our little gatekeepers who actually do this for you, so it does shouldn't come from NIH. So you'll be able to do it before they pass it on to NIH. Here's a progress report. And you can see PMC journal in process for the two for two of the publications listed here. Okay. So how does that generate it? So there is ERA Commons. Okay. So if this sounds like Greek to you, I'm going to explain what ERA Commons is. So here, this is my lame attempt to show you the interconnection with all these systems. There's the NIH Public Access Policy, the Manuscript Submission System, PubMed Central, ERA Commons, My Bibliography. So all of these are intertwined, one to the other. Here's the ERA Commons. So what is the ERA Commons? Any grant holder, NIH grant holder, has an ERA Commons profile. And this is where all their administrative work is done relating to that grant. So has anyone been is familiar with this? Okay. So all of the administrative task related to that grant is done through ERA Commons. So another insidious notice that came out from NIH about ERA Commons. So I'm going to show you what an ERA Commons profile looks like. There is different parts of it. There's a profile saying what institution they're at, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's something called publications. And the My Bibliography, in, which is part of My NCBI, feeds into that publication list in the grantees ERA Commons. And that's the only way you can populate that part of the ERA Commons. It used to be that people could type citations in. On June 10th, 2010, they said you can't do that anymore. You have to populate an ERA Commons publication list through My Bibliography. Okay? Again, they're always saying this makes everything easier. So the PI doesn't need to necessarily be managing that part of ERA Commons in the My Bibliography. They can assign someone to do it for them. And here are the steps um, that they would follow, assigning. So it has to be the PI, the ERA Commons holder, goes into their My Bibliography and assigns the delegate to do all of this for them. So here is the MyNCBI login. This is what it looks like. This has been out there for a long time. This has been out there even before the public access policy <laughs> went into effect. But then they started integrating this into the NIH public access policy, into my bibliography, and so on. So now everything, that lame chart I tried to show you. Um, this is what it is. My NCBI is you can save PubMed searches, you can set up auto alerts for any kind of subject you want to see if there's anything new published, but it's also the My Bibliography part is the part where you manage number one compliance and number two feeds into your ERA Commons or your faculty's ERA Commons. Again, they're always saying it makes everything easier for them, but not necessarily for you at your end. So here's an ERA Commons window for um, an NIH grant holder. If you click on publications, this is what you get. So you can see the citation. You can see those that have a PubMed Central, and there's a PubMed Central ID. And if you look over on the far right, you can see that this ERA Commons holder is a principal investigator on a training grant. So you can see. T32, 
that training, that publication got funded off of the training grant. Now, when it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the you know, PI is an author, it just means that the training grant funded was, funding was used, and when the deposit was made and the training grant was acknowledged, it went into the principal investigator's profile. Okay. So that shows you how this is all integrated here. So here is a ERA Commons holder who has ERA Commons, who's an NIH grant holder, and this is what their my bibliography looks like in my NCBI. So if the person you're supporting assigns you, it makes you the delegate, make sure when you go in there you see that little ERA Commons little logo. That means anything you do here is going to go into their ERA Commons publication list. If you don't see that, it's not linked. And the only way you can get it to link is to contact my NCBI and say, so-and-so's not linked. Okay? The linking pretty much is done, uh, done, but there's still some people who their my bibliography is not linked. Got to make sure it's linked because anything you do here is not going to go into their ERA comments. So these are the little keys if we look back here. You see there's little buttons indicating what's in compliance and what isn't. And this is what the little keys mean. Um, it's, it's not in compliance. You can deposit right from there by clicking on NIMS. Um, you can, you know, if it's NIH funded. Then there is the second one that shows it's in compliance, and this one happens to be a PMC journal in process. Okay, so the systems are intertwined. And then the green one shows it's okay, everything's done, there's a PMC right there. And then when you put something in there, which you probably don't need to do, go back and add things, it says you don't have to. It doesn't need to be in compliance. It's fine. And then there's the other one that has a question mark. So if you click on that, it'll tell you what the problem is for that publication in relation to the public access policy. Okay. So again, makes everything easier. Makes everything easier. <laughs> So again, make sure the person, if you or even that, if they're managing their own My Bibliography, they need to see that little ERA Commons link there. Okay. So if you're the delegate or you are the principal investigator, you can log in in several ways. You can log in right through ERA Commons into My Bibliography. You can um, go to My NCBI and log in, and that would be a delegate's portal to log in to start managing the bibliography. So here is a list of things you have to do to add something to the My Bibliography. Go to the site, log in. So there's different ways. You can see there's um, the My NCBI login, which is where a delegate would go. And then the other side, which is another option for going in to manage the My Bibliography. Um, and you can see there's the UK PMC, that's the, for the people in Great Britain who also need to comply if they have welcome trust funding. So here is a list, this is a delegates list who manages these um, uh, NIH grant holders, their bibliography. So this is what happens when somebody is assigned as a delegate. So they go in and they have everybody here that they have to manage their bibliography. So if they click on this one, they're put into their My Bibliography, and this is where they can start doing all the things they have to do to make sure everything's in compliance and that it's in their ERA Commons publication list. So you can click on one. You can see this one right here, number two, it's the training grant. Because okay, this PI is, is the PI on a training grant. Okay? So how do you add something, start building the, this uh, bibliography? So you click on Add a Citation, and 
This is where this integration is. Previously, people could just type in in the publication list. You can't do that anymore. So you click, you click that you want to add something. You go to PubMed Central, I mean to PubMed, by clicking on go to PubMed. This is the easiest way to find the publication. If you haven't used this, it's a great resource. It's called the Single Citation Matcher, and you can just put in different pieces of information to find the article that you want to add to the bibliography. So if you activate the Single Citation Matcher, it has a little table. You can put in different things. You can put in the author's name and the title or the journal name and maybe the first page number that the article st starts on. And then you hit the search button and it pulls up what you're looking for. So I want to add this to that uh, grant holder's My Bibliography. So I cl click the Send to the drop-down menu, and I select My Bibliography. And as you saw, that person had several um, bibliographies that they manage, so you would need to click the Add to My Bibliography and select from the list. You can select other. Make sure you don't select my because it's not it's not going to go into the ERI Commons persons. So you need to select if you have several from the drop down menu whose bibliography you want it to go into. So I've selected the last option, and it says OK. This is where we're going to put that citation. You click save. Make sure you click save. You'll know if it hasn't saved, so you need to go back and do it. And then you get the little green thing that says, this has been added to the bibliography. Okay. And now it's there. It's number two, but I want to assign a grant number. Even though the deposit uh, has been made and you assign, assigned a grant number, the bibliography also has to have a grant number assigned to it. And you see that what's really nice is because I'm in this person's ERA Commons. I have all their grants listed there, so all I have to do is check whichever one applies and do the save. And now there it is. It's in compliance because it's a PMC journal in process, but I've assigned a grant number to it. Okay? And this will go into that publication list in the ERA Commons. Okay, so there's two buttons. There's the awards which actually we saw when we were in that My Bibliography, that PI's awards were there. And then there's a search and add other awards. Okay. And this is what it looks like now. So there's the awards, which is the PI's awards right in the top, and then there's other awards. So someone else can check another, another award that they acknowledged that may have been acknowledged in the grant. For example, a training grant, a core grant, anything else. So they can check one of these, and then they hit the Save button. But if you're not quite sure, you can find that grant. So the person that wants to assign an additional grant besides the one they assigned in the deposit can search for it, can either put the grant number or the, per, the PI's name. here. And it gives a list, either the grant, there, the first few uh, numbers of the grant or the PI's name. And then you get this list. So this looks like a core grant, a P? Yeah. yeah. So that's what they put in. And here is the PI on that. And they checked it because not only was their grant used, but some funding from this grant was also used. And then they save it. And this tells you that it's going to go into this, that PI's My Bibliography, that someone has, has, done, has done that for them. It also adds it to, as you can see it says, it also adds it to, to that database, which is nice. And then this is what the bibliography looks like for the person who you've added the other grant to. So it says three citations have been added to your bibliography by somebody else, okay? which is nice. If you want to get rid of them, you have to click on the X button. You get rid of the message. And this is what it looks like. It's, it is sort of nice. I haven't tried it yet. 
So it actually does somebody a favor. Um, have you seen any of these yet? It's new, yeah. Project reports for the training grants would all have gone out. Right, but it just came out, yeah, and that wasn't May or something for the training, some of the training grants. But anyhow, it's a new thing, so I'm sure that it'll come across their desk um, soon. And then when you're in the, the, your bibliography, you can see that it tells who added it. It was added by another PI. Or the NIM system added it. So you can see how this is really, like, like a spider web. Everything's all connected, which is sort of good. You just have to get used to it. Okay, we're ready for questions.